Um, my name is Ravi Chityala. Um, I have specialized in image processing. That's my, that was my topic in my PhD. And then uh, I went to work at the University of Minnesota. While, while at the University of Minnesota, I used to work with all the faculties and graduate students there. And I used to solve image processing problems for them. And one thing I found was that many of these people, they actually have an image processing problem that's actually really simple. It requires some simple understanding of image processing. And then write some simple Python code that maybe takes 20, 30 lines of code. And then they get what they want. Instead, they will wait for me for like a week or two weeks because I was busy with other things and then wasting their time, two weeks of their time. So then later at one of the conference, I met an editor who, um, who, for, to whom I suggested this a book, uh, a book on image processing using Python for people who don't do Python or, or they don't program in image processing and they're just learning their way around Python. Okay. So it needs to, the program of the book has to be as simple as possible. At the same time, it should teach the basics of image processing so that people can actually solve the basic problems all by themselves. So that's how I, we ended up writing a book. Um, it was co-authored uh, by me and my wife, Sri Devi Puripedi. And then eventually, um, we started getting a lot of interesting feedbacks, and then I gave one or two talks, and here is one of the talks to introduce the very basics of image processing and using Python. Um, the reason I, we chose Python was because, one, I was already enjoying programming in Python. Okay. In fact, uh, I was looking for a scripting language to program, and then I tried different things like Perl and PHP, and then I found Python, and I just stopped right there. I didn't mo move beyond that. I didn't look for Ruby and Rails or anything like that. Um, so the Python, the reason we chose Python was it's, uh, I was very comfortable with it. It is a great language. It's an amazing language to program. Um, and also the fact that it's very easy to explain to people. You look at the code and you actually can understand what's going on with the code. So, um, so the book is Image Processing and Acquisition Using Python. Um, it's, uh, it's available, it's just published by CRC Press and it's available at Amazon and other booksellers. So um, after I moved to Silicon Valley, I started teaching at the University of California Santa Cruz Extension Program, which is at Santa Clara. Uh, I teach advanced Python. Um, so in case if you guys were interested, check it out at the UCSC Extension website. Image processing is a really huge topic. In fact, within image processing, there's actually so many divisions. Like there is computer vision. Um, today, image processing involves machine learning. Uh, you cannot separate them, uh, separate them out anymore because uh, most of the basic image processing problems have kind of been solved. Um, they're pretty much available as algorithms. You can just call one line of code and you can get your work done. Uh, so then next generation of algorithms that people are working on are mostly involving data science and machine learning. Um, but because it's a 50 minute talk, I need to somehow teach you some basics of it. So I'm going to squeeze in the basics. Hopefully you'll understand uh, most of the stuff that I'm going to talk about. Um, to make sure that you understand the basics, I'm going to use this image processing pipeline. Okay? Um, it's basically, you go through certain steps in, a, in pretty much every problem in image processing, whether you're trying to solve the problem of autonomous driving or whether you're tr trying to solve a problem with medical image processing. You go through a certain pipeline of workflow. So in that pipeline, I'll give you one or two examples. Um, I'll uh, do one example with filtering. How do you filter an image so that you get a good quality image? Um, and then I'll talk about segmentation, which is the process of separating the various things in an image into objects so that you can do further processing with them. And then we'll talk about morphology. It's actually one of my favorite topics. It's actually a pretty simple and a cool technique that was created sometime in the 1950s that actually gives an amazing effect on images. And then finally, I'll finish it off with uh, measurements. Um, the aim for any image processing technique, uh, whether it's autonomous cars or medical imaging, is to take an image and you somehow want to measure things or count things and things like that. Okay. Um, so for example, in autonomous driving, you want to make sure that you want to see how many vehicles are there around you so that you can avoid them. Okay. Um, so which means you need to be able to segment these various cars and trucks that are around you. So that's, that's kind of like the process of segmentation. Uh, in the medical imaging or the microscope imaging world, um, measurement is actually the big thing. So there is a cancer patient, the images come in, and you want to know how big is the tumor, or how widespread is the tumor. Is it only localized to a certain area, or is it spread over the whole lung, for example? So measurement becomes a critical part to um, part of image processing pipeline. So. Um, 
maybe I should start with this. So first of all, what's an image? Um, there, is, there is many many possible definitions to an image, but as far as, the, as far as this particular talk is concerned, let's just focus on two-dimensional images because that's the one that's easy to understand. Um, a two-dimensional image is basically a 2D matrix containing X and Y pixels, okay? So the pixels could be of any range of pixel value. Um, generally, if you take a JPEG or a PNG image, the pixel depth go from zero to 256, okay? Whereas for medical images, the, the, um, uh, the pixel depth is generally higher because you want to get as much information as possible. Uh, for example, in the case of a CT image, generally it's 12-bit, which means the pixel values go anywhere from uh, 0 to 4096. Um, depending on the other uh, fields, it might be even higher. Okay. Um, the images come in different, different formats. You have photographs, medical images, microscope images, and there are so many other ones as well. Um, but essentially, whatever filter you apply to one type of image, you could theoretically apply to other images as well. But sometimes these filters don't apply exactly in the way we imagine it. Um, for example, a filter like unsharp masking, as it's applied to, let's say, photography, might have a completely different effect when you apply it on a medical image. Okay? Uh, but they still have some effect. So that's why it's always important to understand what kind of images am I working with and apply the associated filter that goes with it. Okay. So we'll talk about that when we talk about filters. Um, the image processing pipeline that I always like to show is, it's kind of really simple. You start by reading an image. Okay. It doesn't matter what kind of image processing you're doing, you start by reading some form of an image. Um, either an image that's coming live, like in autonomous cars, the images are coming live, the videos are coming live, and you're processing them. Or in the case of medical images, mostly it is uh, acquired and stored somewhere, and then you read those images. Um, it doesn't matter what format it is, you essentially end up doing things like filtering. Uh, filtering is an operation where you try to remove undesirable objects, or you try to highlight the desirable objects in a more uh, profound manner. So when I say an undesirable object, imagine you have an image containing photographs of something, and then there is one or two pixels that are corrupted, okay? And these corrupt pixels can actually skew your calculation. So you want to remove those bad pixels. So how do you remove them? You use a process called filtering. And what filter would you use? It depends on what you're trying to achieve. So if for the case that I just told you, where there is bad pixels spread all over the place, there is a pretty standard type of filter um, called a salt and pepper filter, a median filter. Okay, you can use that to remove um, these undesirable pixels. Um, an example that I'm going to show you, I'm actually not trying to remove something, but instead I'm trying to enhance something that I actually want to see more strongly. Okay, so that's another form of filtering. And as I told you, every filter that you use depends on the type of modality that you use. So for example, a filter that you use for uh, a CT is different from a filter that you use for microscope imaging versus a filter that you use for photography even though theoretically the filter can be applied to all three, three images. Okay? So it's always good to know what image you're acquiring and then apply the filter that goes along with it. Um, segmentation. Segmentation is a process where you separate the objects in an image into parts. So for example, an autonomous car scenario, the car is driving on the road, you want to know where are the lane markings, where is the road, where is the horizon, uh, what are the nearby cars. So these are the various objects in an image and you want to separate them out. And that's generally done using a process of segmentation. Um, as I told you at the beginning, um, segmentation can be simple and complex. Um, today, for example, if you're trying to do the autonomous driving, it's no longer a simple case of saying, I'm going to take all these things with this pixel value and call them as trucks. All these pixels with this pixel value being horizon. It doesn't work like that. Um, you can easily imagine one scenario, probably it's not a typical scenario in California. Imagine you're driving on a snowy road and it's snowing heavily. It's just impossible to see the difference between the road and the horizon. Everything looks white, okay? So a simple applying a pixel value to an image is not going to give you the road versus the horizon. Um, so that's why today's image processing involves lots of machine learning as well. That goes with, oh, today's condition is snowing. So which means I need to use other markings other than just pixel value to segment an image. 
Okay, so things have gotten a lot complicated. Um, registration. Uh, registration is uh, generally applied in medical and microscope imaging, where you take one image and you try to make the other image look like the first image. Okay, not exactly look like them, but you try to move them around so that you can match the two. Okay. Um, an example is imagine uh, this is this is one of the work that I do currently, um, which is in the field of medical. A patient comes in for cancer treatment, and they t acquire an image called a planning image. Okay. And then whenever the patient comes for treatment, you need to position the patient at exactly the same place where you position the patient during the planning. Okay? If the position is different, then you're giving the radiation therapy treatment at a wrong location. And so this positioning has to be done as accurately as possible within like submillimeters. So if you want to do that, the only way to do that would be take an image before, take an image after, match the two image, find out how much you need to move the second image so that it matches the first image. And that movement is the movement that you have to give to the patient so that you match the position correctly. Okay. So that process is called uh, registration. Um, in painting, um, you guys would, have, would not have heard the term in painting, but it's actually a pretty common term. Um, but it's called very differently in the normal colloquial term, which is airbrushing. Okay. When somebody airbrushes a face of a model, they're using a wand or something and then just moving it around. And the pixels that were there in that position are replaced by a different pixel value. Okay? And what pixel value do you replace with? It's done using this process called in-painting. Okay? So it's a different name, but it's nothing but airbrushing. And then there's morphology. We'll talk about it a little later. And you read an image, and you do all these processing, maybe one or more, not all of them, not necessarily all of them. And then once you're done with all that, you basically write the image or you visualize the image. Or in some cases, you make a decision, like in autonomous driving, you say that, oh, there is a truck nearby. Uh, you just redirect the car to a different lane or something like that. Okay. Filters. Um, so as far as this uh, image processing using Python is concerned, uh, the modules that is generally used are SciPy and SciKits. Uh, so those are the two most popular modules. Um, Sometimes when people come from the side of MATLAB, they're already using MATLAB for doing image processing. They come to Python, they say that oh, it doesn't have all the functionality that MATLAB has, which I have to agree. MATLAB is a multi-million dollar company with hiring lots of people, paying them full-time job, paying them for a full-time job, and it's able to build all these algorithms. But Python is actually catching up. Um, there is lots of algorithms in SciKits and SciPy. Um, they are also coming up with more and more algorithms. Um, in fact, I'm a co-organizer of a meetup in Sunnyvale, and we even had a hackathon where we took some image processing algorithms that are written in Java and converted them into Python. Um, and in a matter of one hour, we were able to convert three algorithms among. So we formed three groups, four people each. We converted those uh, three algorithms into Python. Okay? And we put it on GitHub so that anybody can actually use it. Um, so things are coming up. It's not perfect, but it's, it's, the good things are going to happen. Okay. Um, just like machine learning, Python has become pretty much a standard way of, uh, or one of the standard way of programming machine learning or data science. Um, image processing is also an up-and-coming up field in uh, Python. So um, as far as the filters are concerned, uh, the examples I'm going to show you are mostly in scikit images. Um, so it's, this URL can give you some more information about the various filters that are available in uh, scikit images. And after this presentation is done, I'll be sharing this presentation and the program um, through some mechanism that's already built into this conference. Okay, so you should be able to go there and download the presentation and the uh, programs. So uh, before I tell you what unsharp masking is, I just want to show you the image first. Okay. Uh, the effect might not be as obvious in a projector because the projectors don't have that great resolution, but when you look at a computer screen, you'll actually see the difference. So the left image, uh, the image is basically an image of an electron microscope, uh, acquired from an electron microscope. Um, the effect that we were trying to get was to make the image more, have a higher contrast, okay? And I used this process called unsharp masking. So when I talked about filters, uh, I told you that in a filter, you can remove undesirable things or you can make desirable things more stronger, okay? And again, I'm giving a very colloquial definition of it. It's not exactly how that always works. Um, but one of the things about filters is that when you apply a filter, you also get side effects. So you try, you have a noise in the image, you try to apply a Gaussian filter, you remove the noise, but you have smoothing problem. 
okay? Uh, you apply a median filter, you get rid of the salt and pepper noise, but you have a smoothing problem. Okay? So every filter has its side effect. So you always choose a filter so that the side effect is at the minimal as possible. Okay? So in this filter, um, I'm combining two filters together, um, and that's called the unsharp masking. Um, to remove the noise and make the image more stronger, the normal approach that people take is to apply something called a derivative filter. Okay? A derivative-based filter basically highlights the edges and suppresses anything that's a uniform region. So making the edges stronger, that means human eyes are always looking for edges, so we think the image actually has got better contrast. Okay? But the problem with the uh, derivative-based filters is that they actually create more noise. And that's not desirable either. So that's why somebody came up with this idea of unsharp masking, where you first smooth the image, and then you apply the derivative filter. And that amazingly reduces the noise, but still improves the edge and enhances the edge a lot. So um, for example, on this image, on the left image is the original image, and the right image is the um, unsharp masked image. Um, on the left image, if you look at this region, um, and if you compare that with this region, it might not be that obvious in the projector, but when you look at the screen, you will, you will see that the contrast is actually much, much better. You can see the details, and when you actually do image processing on it, you will actually find that it actually gives better results than the one on the left. Okay. And similarly, the details, some of the details here are much strongly highlighted in this area. Okay. So how do you apply this filter? Um, so here is the code. There is a certain boilerplate that I have to add to my code. Um, so the real piece of code for unsharp masking is only this. This function, called unsharp masking, is the key thing behind uh, this process. And the rest of the thing that I do here, it's a pretty straightforward thing, where I open an image, I use the uh, PIL open function to open this PNG image, and then I convert it into a NumPy array, so that I can then give this NumPy array to this unsharp masking function to do its job, and ultimately I then save the image or I show the image, depending on how I choose to. Pretty straightforward boilerplate thing. I'm going to be using this for all the other code as well. Okay? Open an image, call a function, and then save the image or, write the, or project the image to a screen. So um, the unsharp masking, this is the function. And there is as many lines of comments here as the number of lines of code. So the real line of code is actually only three of them. Um, the first line of code is I'm calling the SciPy or the SciPy's ND image has this, uh, I give an alias to it called SND. And then I call the Gaussian filter under that SND uh, alias. And I give the image IM, which is the NumPy array, and I specify the sigma that I want to apply. Again, this is a toy example, so I'm just choosing sigma is equal to 1.0. But if it's a real world scenario, you might have to choose sigma according to your condition. Okay. The higher the sigma, the more blurring it's going to be. And then the unsharp masking says that blur the image first, which is this blurred image. And then you subtract the image. The original image minus the blurred image gives me the subtracted image. And that subtracted image basically has the highlighted, the edges pretty strong. It's, it's highlighted pretty strongly. And when you subtract it back to the original image, you are actually adding the edges to the image, making the edges more stronger. And that, in turn, makes the human eye think there is actually better contrast. Okay. So that's essentially unsharp masking. And to do this, I basically piggy banked on the SciPy's Gaussian filter. I didn't create this filter, I just piggy banked on an existing filter. Okay. All right. Any question about this? Okay, so So the next process is called segmentation. Um, it's a process where I, as I told you, you'll separate uh, different parts in an image into various objects so that you can do further processing with them. Um, Python comes with some segmentation techniques, um, and there are many, many more of them, depending on the type of modality you're applying and type of images you're applying. And some of those uh, segmentation techniques are available in that URL. I'm going to talk about one specific segmentation technique called Rene entropy. And uh, this, uh, and we are actually going to write the code for this. Okay, I'm going to show you how the code is written. And as you will see, even though this algorithm is not built into Python, it doesn't take that many number of lines of code to actually write a segmentation technique using Python. 
So this Rene entropy is uh, is one type of entropy, and it's the, the concept of entropy comes from the world of information theory, and the Rene entropy is basically defined something like this. Okay, one by one minus alpha log sum of probability of occurrence over the alpha. Okay. What that means is, I know this is, sounds too mathematical, but really what that means when it comes to an image is, you take a histogram of an image, and then you identify the entropy to the left of a given t and to the right of the given t. Okay? And how do you find the entropy? You just follow this formula. A histogram of an image is nothing but a probability of occurrence of pixels. Okay? For example, if let's say this pixel value was uh, 50, 50 occurs this many number of times. Okay? This is, let's say it is 20, 20 occurs so many number of times. Or if I turn it around and say this pixel has a probability of so much of occurrence in that specific image, okay? And that being, let's say, 0.1, okay? So which means if somebody says, I want to look for a pixel of value 20, I will say there's a probability of 10% that you will actually find the value in this image, okay? So a histogram can easily be converted to probability because all that you have to do is you have to take every count in the histogram divided by the number of pixels, and that gives you the probability. And that probability is what we are going to use when it comes to the calculation of the Rene entropy. And the alpha, uh, at least for my case, I chose a certain value based on my experiments. But depending on the scenario, you'll have to choose the cor corresponding alpha. OK. So um, I take every position, t, and I find the uh, entropy to the left of the t and to the right of the t. And then I sum those two entropy. And then I keep repeating this process for all the pixel values, all the way from 0 to 256, okay, or whatever that maximum value. And then the point at which the entropy is at the maximum is my Rene entropy threshold. Okay? And Rene entropy algorithm basically says that any pixel value that is more than the threshold is, gives you the foreground, and anything below that gives you the background. Okay? And this technique is pretty popular among the field people in medical and microscope imaging. And it used to actually be applied to photographs, but today's photographs have gotten much, much more complicated. So and people, I, to my knowledge, people no longer apply Rene entropy because there are so many other techniques that have come. Okay. So here is an image. This is an image of a mice, um, a micro CT image of a mice, um, obtained at very high resolution. Uh, this is actually a cropped version of it. Uh, the original image was actually 2,000 pixels by 2,000 pixels, and there are 6,000 such slices. Okay, so the data set was like 50 gigabytes in size. And the aim of this work was to actually segment the bone in the image as accurately as possible. Because the faculty actually spent a lot of money to acquire these images, and they wanted to make sure that they actually get the best quality results possible. Okay. So I just want to highlight this one yellow area and show you the difference between applying the unsharp masking and then doing a segmentation versus not applying unsharp masking and, apply and doing the segmentation. Okay. And you'll see the results are actually pretty different. So here is the original image uh, on that just yellow area, on that yellow box. So here is the original image, and that's the uh, unsharp masked image. Um, again, from the projector, it might not be that obvious. But if you look at the screen, you will see that the uh, areas that are these black areas, those are the marrow. Okay? So this is the outermost layer of the bone. And all these web-like structure that you see is called cortical. Okay? And, um, and then the innermost area that's hollow, those are the areas where the marrow is actually, marrow resides, the bone marrow resides. Now, the aim was to actually get the bone and the cortical as accurately as possible. Okay? As accurately as possible. It's never going to be exactly, because there's other, in, um, other uh, issues in imaging called partial volume artifacts and things like that that will prevent you from actually getting the exact value. So you want to get as accurately as possible. Now, I'll show you Rene entropy, the algorithm, later, but I want to show you the results. So if I take this image, the original image and the unsharp masked image, and I apply the Rene entropy algorithm, I'll end up with a segmentation that looks like this. So on the left is the original image, not filtered, and this one is the filtered image. And as you can see, that the marrow is pretty much lost here. Okay? And even in this area, it's kind of lost. It's smaller than the corresponding areas in the filtered image, okay? All by just act, act applying one extra filter to the image. Okay. And here is the algorithm. Okay. So 
before I go through reading the algorithm, one point I want to highlight is that um, with Python, um, it's getting pretty good at the image processing uh, libraries. Uh, one of the things um, I found was that there is a f image format for specifically for medical imaging people. It's called DICOM, um, Digital Image Communication for Medical Images, or something like that, DICOM standard. Um, that standard is actually pretty complicated. Uh, it's not as simple as JPEG or PNG. Um, DICOM requires a lot more nuances and details. And surprisingly, Python, actually, there is a module called PyDICOM, which actually allows you to read DICOM images, and it actually does a pretty good job. So that's the, um, that's the, that's the module that I'm going to be using to read the image. Um, so it, you call the read file in the DICOM module, and you give it a DICOM image, and it gets a pixel array, get the pixel array, which is nothing but a NumPy array, and then I'm going to give it to the unsharp masking filter so that it does the unsharp masking and get me the edges strong. And then I'm going to call the Rene segmentation function. Okay, and pass the image, and this is three is the value of the alpha that I told you before. Okay. And then this method, the Rene segmentation function, basically returns a threshold where any pixel that's above that value is the foreground, which is the bone, and anything below that, I call it as a background. Okay. And then I'm just going to apply it the threshold like this, okay? That's amazing. It's just one line of code. I don't, I'm not even going pixel by pixel and applying. I just say I am greater than threshold. Well, I am is a NumPy array, and the thresh is the pixel value beyond which it's foreground and below that is background. And I get a NumPy array called threshold images, which is a 2D matrix containing whites and white and black. Yeah. I could, uh, not for this example, but once you guys have the code, you can always play around with it and do whatever you want. Yeah, definitely. All right, so and then I'm printing the threshold. Okay, and then finally I'm saving the image as a PNG so that I can visualize the thresholded value. Okay, so this unsharp masking function is exactly the same as the one I showed you before. And here is the NA entropy. Again, there is as many lines of code as there is. Uh, uh, comments, okay? So the function might look longer, but really speaking, it, it's simple enough that I can explain it to you right now. So I'm first getting the histogram of an image, which is one of the fundamental information that you always get from an image so that you can understand what the image does. Um, in fact, uh, whenever I teach Python or whenever I teach image processing, I tell people, if there is one thing you should always look at an image, it's a histogram, okay? People actually miss that step. They don't realize that there is actually so much information in a histogram that they just quickly go to the filter and start applying filter and segmentation and all that. You look at a histogram, take your time, understand what the histogram does, then you will actually be able to come up with the filter, the correct filter and the correct segmentation technique really quickly once you understand what the histogram is saying. Okay. Um, just like when a doctor takes a pulse to get a feel for what a human body is going through, okay, same way the histogram basically gives you a pulse of an image. Um, then I convert uh, the, I get the histogram and I get the zeroth part of the uh, zero array um, from that histogram. The reason I have to get the zeroth one is because the IMEXP's histogram, this one, um, it's actually written for color images, okay? So it'll go to return red, green, blue channel, uh, three different histograms. But I'm only, I have only a grayscale image, so I'm just saying, give me only the first one, which is the grayscale one, okay? So that's why I get the first one and then I convert it into float so that I can do further calculation. The reason I have to convert it into float, because the, all the calculation I'm going to do subsequently are all floating point arithmetic, okay? I cannot deal them with integers. I'll end up with the precision problems. And then I find the, uh, remember I told you about probability, and I told you that uh, it's nothing but the total number of pixels, and that's what I'm doing here. np.sum histogram underscore float gives me the total number of pixels. And then I'm dividing every frequency by the number of pixels in the histogram. And now I get what is called the probability distribution function, okay? A fancy term for saying, for a given frequency, this is the probability of occurrence of a given pixels. And then I find cumulative uh, sum of the probability distribution function. Again, I'm not doing any of those sum. I just give it to this method called CUM, SUM, and gives me the cumulative sum. Okay. Again, part of NumPy. Um, then I'm going through every pixel, starting from number one, pixel value number one, all the way to pixel value RR. Um, and then um, finding the, the left side 
to the left of the given pixel value, what is the uh, entropy? And H2 gives me what is to the right of the uh, pixel value. And then I finally sum all those entropies together. Now I end up with a, basically a vector called T, which basically contains uh, all the entropy, starting from the pixel value 0 to pixel value n, whatever that n is. Then I want to get what is the position at which the maximum value happens. To get that, all that I have to do is I have to just say t dot arg max axis equal to 0. Because the vector, I'm saying on a one-dimensional vector, which is axis equal to 0, get me the position where the maximum value happens. Okay? Again, I'm not going around looking for it. I'm just calling the function, and it gives me the value. And then finally, that location, I just call it as a threshold, and I return the threshold value. Okay. Um, one point I want to highlight is uh, when NumPy was uh, created, they kind of took lots of uh, um, concepts from MATLAB, or the when I say concepts as in how MATLAB calls its functions and methods, they took some of those ideas and implemented it. So if you're already a MATLAB programmer, and if you want to move to NumPy and SciPy, you'll actually find it pretty easy. Um, for example, in MATLAB, you can do this. You can say, here's a matrix, and greater than some pixel value, and it'll create a segmented image where all pixels which are greater than that will have a value 1. All pixels less than the threshold will have a value equal to 0. Okay? Ma this is a MATLAB notation. NumPy took that concept and applied it, making our life easy. <clears throat> in fact, in NumPy website, there is actually a table which says that if you have this MATLAB function call or if this statement, here's the corresponding NumPy function call or statement. Okay? That makes it really easy for you to say, OK, so this is my MATLAB code. I'm going to look at this, and I'm going to convert it into this. Okay. And at all point, if you notice, I'm rarely iterating through anything, except for this place. Okay? I'm doing lots of interesting things, like I'm finding the maximum value, and uh, here I'm thresholding. But at no point, I'm actually iterating through anything. I'm just, everything is a matrix operation. And everything is faster for that reason. Okay? The moment you start iterating, you're going to be really slow. Okay? So let's run this code. So, all right. It's going to spit out uh, the threshold 9148. Oh, sorry, 2595. And it segmented the image. And if I go and so here's my segmented PNG image. And I can visualize how the image looks. Okay. Any question about that? Yeah. Oh, uh, how do I determine whether this is actually a good enough segmentation? <clears throat> so for this specific case, uh, this is part of a different paper. Um, what we did was we had another person who knows the anatomy of mice, and he manually segmented like few of the slices, and then we compare the manually segmented with the automatically segmented one. Okay, and we found that it took him like a minute to actually segment an image manually, and it took only like 0.2 seconds or so to actually segment automatically. And if it takes one minute, he's not going to sit down and segment 6,000 slices. Okay? Whereas an automatic technique, we should just go through and 20, maybe an hour or so, it's done. So. All right. All right, so we saw, oh, uh, and finally, let me finish this off with this one. So this visualization was done, not done using Python, but the segmentation was. Um, and here is the, after segmenting, putting all these things together and visualize using uh, a software called Aviso. So this is what we ended up with. It's an ISO surface rendering of the mice. Okay. All right. <clears throat> this is one of my favorite technique. Um, so if, let's, let's go back to this image. So remember these pixels, OK? And remember them. And let's, uh, these pixels, 
or one off pixels here and there distributed okay they might create problems depending on what you're trying to achieve okay so we could easily clean this uh, clean up these pixels by using this process called morphology <clears throat> so um, morphology is a nonlinear operation that modifies the shape or morphology of an object okay and the way it does is using two basic operations called dilation and erosion and then there is a two complex operation called opening and closing and then there are many more operations but if you understand these four you can actually go a long way in doing whatever you're doing so the as the name says the dilation the english word dilation means grow okay so the dilation does exactly the same thing if you have an object and if you call the dilate on it okay it will make that object grow bigger so if your object is let's say a radius of 10 pixels and if you call dilate by one pixel now the object will be of radius 11 pixels okay um, the erosion is the exact opposite if you have an object of radius 10 pixels and if you say erode by one pixel it now becomes a radius of 9 pixels okay simple operation and in opening you <clears throat> combine you first do the erosion and then you do the dilation okay so which means you first start by saying okay erode by one pixel it shrinks and then if you say grow back it just grows back to its original shape okay but in the case of a circular object it kind of makes sense that you if you erode, erode and dilate it will go back to its original shape potentially but really speaking in real world cases the operation of opening will not get you back to the original form okay but it's always useful to remove some objects for example uh, all those one pixels i showed you you still want to measure those the number of pixels in the bone but you want to still get rid of those one or two pixels here and there you can apply the opening operation where you erode one pixel that one pixel thing is gone and then you dilate back your bone is actually kind of back in shape but those one pixels are all gone okay and similarly closing also is the opposite of opening where you first do dilation which means you grow it first and then you erode okay so these are the four basic operations and in in the case of uh, python numpy or uh, scipy has it um this operation is actually it's pretty ex pretty fast so if at all possible if you want to clean an object this is probably the best way to clean when it comes to image processing operation okay and measurements so i'm giving a simple scenario but measurements could involve many many things uh, and in the book we talk about two or three different uh, scenarios like uh, how do you find a circle in an image or how do you measure objects like this um or there's another one where you want to count okay um and there are many other scenarios where you want to do measurements so here is an example of uh, one type of measurements um this actually the concept is actually kind of borrowed from matlab uh, matlab has this concept called region props um region properties it stands for region properties um the idea is you separate an image into various objects and you call each one of those as regions and then you want to measure the properties of those regions okay so that's why matlab calls it region properties or region props and python took pretty much the same concept and then they reimplemented it in c and called it using scipy so the leftmost image is the original image then the right image is the segmented and labeled image and finally the rightmost image shows you that uh, it found all the bounding boxes that's those are the black squares around or rectangles around each of those shapes and then it also found the centroid that's the centermost dart for each of those objects okay let's look at the code <clears throat> again there's a bunch of boilerplate code where i open an image i convert it into a numpy array called a and then i use a technique a segmentation technique called otsu method um which is already built into um scipy you can just use it uh, it's unlike rene entropy otsu is actually built into python and then you already remember this one where i say this matrix greater than threshold basically it gives you a segmented image where all pixels more than the threshold are one all pixels less than threshold are equal to 0 okay. then i call label which basically labels the object so if you have like 100 objects it gives a number to each one of those objects and uh, again some boilerplate code for me so that i can show you those images and then the region props basically you call you give a matrix a 2d matrix 
C to region props, and it calculate it takes that individual objects in the image and calculates the region properties for each one of them. Okay, that could be there are many. There's a huge list of properties that it calculates, uh, like bounding box, centroid, and uh, a few other things. Um, and then here is some boilerplate code to actually plot it. So I'm using matplotlib um, to create subplots. And I'm printing the centroids. And I'm plotting them here. So that's why when you, rem you remember on the image, on the image at the centroid, I have this dot. Okay. So these dots are basically coming from this plt.plots centroid x and y coordinate. And it needs to be uh, O indicates a circle. And R stands for red, but if it's a color image, you will see it. But I have a, gr a grayscale image there. And then this gives me the bounding box. The region properties found the bounding box. And it gives me the left, uh, right, left, uh, center, sorry, lower left, lower right, upper left, and upper right. And I can calculate the width and the height. And then I'm putting the bounding box rectangle around it. And finally, I'm placing all that into the plot. Okay. Again, I'm doing all this so that I can show you the plot. But really speaking, if you want to just get the region properties, all that you have to do is you have to call this one line. Okay? And you get the region properties. And um, the uh, one more tool that you always end up using when it comes to image processing is matplotlib. And matplotlib, again, they took concepts from MATLAB and nicely implemented it in Python. So if you're coming from the world of MATLAB, you will actually find lots of things similar. For example. MATLAB does exactly the same notation when it comes to giving a color. For example, it uses R, G, B, Y, and things like that for the color of the bounding box. And then the O stands for a circle, or star stands for a star symbol. Instead of a circle, you can put a star. Okay. So they took a lot of concepts from MATLAB and then used it inside Python. Okay. All right. And this example is already here in this code called regionprops underscore eg1.py, which I'll be sharing with everybody. Okay. So if you're going to start off with uh, doing image processing using Python, um, one thing I would always recommend is use one of the distributions. Okay. Um, I don't know how many of you are uh, programming Python for the first time or maybe going to do scientific computing using Python for the first time. Uh, one thing I, all, I want to tell you is that um, Many of the modules that we, that the scientific computing community uses, uh, it's all written in C. Okay. So if you try to do pip install NumPy, what essentially happens is it goes and gets the NumPy source code, tries to compile it on your local machine, and tries to install it. Okay. Um, I'm saying it in a very simplistic manner, but the, really speaking, there's more complex things happen. There's a library called Boost that NumPy uses to do its calculation. Okay. And compiling and installing Boost is not for everybody. It's just way too complicated. Okay. So that's where some people found a nice business opportunity. And they created all these distributions. Okay. Um, there is this Nthought Canopy. There is a free version of the Nthought Canopy distribution. Um, what they've done with this distribution is they took all these scientific computing packages. They built it for you. That way, when you install it, you don't need a compiler on your machine. The distribution takes care of it for you. It gets you the version that's already pre-compiled for your operating system, puts it and puts it all in the right place, and now you just have access to it. Okay. Uh, the same is true for sorry, there's a spelling mistake here. It's Anaconda. Um, same is true for Anaconda. Um, so that's how it started. They started with the Python distribution where you can get stuff for, uh, easily for scientific purpose. Uh, but today, Anaconda has moved much past that, and they have lots of interesting tools that they uh, provide. Okay. So I want you guys to check out that as well. And then there's a free one called Python XY. Also, uh, the Nthought Canopy and Anaconda both have a free version, uh, but they also have a paid version. And Python XY is a completely free one. But the only bad thing about Python XY, it's, it's a Windows only. Okay? Whereas the other two, they are for Windows, Mac, and Linux. So you can install it on pretty much any operating system. Okay? And uh, if you want to explore further, um, you can check out all these uh, packages. Uh, NumPy, SciPy, SciKit image, those are pretty straightforward. Everybody uses it. Um, there is uh, this interesting library called Mahotas. Um, it doesn't have many functionality, but it's actually super fast. Okay, it does small things, but it does it really well. Um, and as I told you before, image processing and machine learning today go together. 
So which means you take an image, you take some vector of information out of it, and then you give it to a machine learning technique and say, go do some work for me, and then you take that output and then do something with it. Okay. And uh, scikit-learn is probably one of the fastest way you can actually get into machine learning. Probably not the most efficient way if you're going to scale, but it's definitely the first one one should learn. And then uh, matplotlib, if you want to visualize things. And finally, OpenCV. Okay. And this library, we haven't talked about it here, but we, um, we do talk about it in the book. Um, it's probably one of the most popular computer vision module in the world. Okay. Uh, they have a C binding, they have a C++ binding, and they have a Python binding as well. And if there is any complex operation that needs to be done, try to first look up OpenCV. Probably it has something for you. All right. I would say almost 95% of the stuff that's in OpenCV is actually available for free, and anybody can use it, including commercial reasons, a commercial purpose. Uh, but there is one or two algorithms that have been patented, so people are not supposed to use it for commercial purpose. So that's something you should keep in, uh, keep tab of. Okay, there's only one or two of them, not many. Okay. But otherwise, it's the go-to person for me when it comes to any complex uh, computer vision or image processing operation. Okay, All right, that's it. Thank you so much. I know you only talked about grayscale, so how hard is it to actually add color to all this? <clears throat> all right. Um, so it depends on the processing that one is trying to do. Uh, many a time, the way people handle a color image is they separate them into three channels and apply basically a grayscale-based processing on these three channels. But in some scenario, you might want to um, combine them together, um, not treat them as three separate things. So again, it depends on the kind of operation that is done. Um, whether it doesn't matter whether it's scikit image or OpenCV or SciPy, they all handle color images. Although I gave you examples of grayscale here. It's an excellent talk. Um, it, in, in your code, you had a lot of scikit image in there, and then you briefly mentioned OpenCV. So can you say what problems would you go to scikit image versus OpenCV? Because I see both of them referenced quite often in the Python community. OK. Um, maybe we should just go to the browser and look up OpenCV. And, uh... OK. Um, when it comes to OpenCV, it's, as the name says, it's about computer vision. OK. Image processing is a much more um, fundamentals of uh, fundamental things about image pro uh, about uh, let me rephrase it so image processing comes way below and computer vision sits on top okay image processing tells you how do you process an image so that you can help computer vision do its job okay so which means when it comes to image processing you'll be talking in terms of pixels and bytes and things like that but the computer vision on the other hand is more about understanding the world so I have an image of a person. I want to know where is their eye, where is their nose, where is their mouth. Okay. So those kind of problems are computer vision problems. You're they're helping the computer understand the world. Okay. And OpenCV comes with lots of those tools. Uh, it also comes with image processing tools, but its specific use case is actually on much higher level. Okay. Um, for example, uh, let's see. There is this. Um, So here is the image processing part of uh, um, OpenCV. They have image filtering. They have image transforms. Um, we talk about that in the book. Uh, it talks about histograms and feature detection, object detection. And then you come further up. It even has some machine learning tools that's needed for computer understanding. As I told you, problems have gotten more and more complicated. It's no longer that I process pixels and then I get what I want. You have to do even more beyond just a regular image processing. So that's where OpenCV is trying to put machine learning also into uh, this. And then, oh, the other factor I wanted to point out is GPU. Uh, OpenCV is actually capable of processing using a GPU. Okay, I don't think Scikit can do that. And um, <laughs> there's one thing I wanted to 
I'm trying to recall. So there is there is actually an algorithm in uh, OpenCV. So if imagine it's a driving on a road and you're having a camera and you're taking a picture or taking a video and you want to find out if there are any humans that are walk crossing the road okay um, there is a technique called histogram of oriented gradient okay and opencv has it okay scikit doesn't because it's a pretty high level concept and opencv does that but python doesn't or scikit doesn't okay so Um, you, you kind of briefly skimmed through uh, like 3D images, of voxels. Is there any recommendation over there, uh, like in terms of libraries and techniques, stuff like that? Um, so normally when I process these 3D images for medical or microscope purpose, um, normally do it using, uh, so we treat them as individual slices. So 3D image is a series of 2D images, okay? And then we process them. So in that sense, that's one way of looking at it. Um, the other way of looking at it would be 3D, you can th think of each position being a vector with information, and then you can process a vector, okay? So instead of thinking as 2 by, uh, sorry, 1024 by 1024, 6,000 of them, you can think of them as 1024 by 1024, with each point having a vector with 6,000 values. Okay, so that's another way people process. Again, it depends on the application. It's, there's no one answer or the other, okay? But mostly when these algorithms, the one that are general purpose, they always treat everything as a 2D image at some point internally and do the calculation, okay? But they abstract it away from you so that you might not even realize they do it, but many times they do. Any other question? Okay. Hey, uh, you talked about the importance of um, reading and understanding the histograms, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if um, there's any common patterns you've seen in histograms and maybe some useful approaches you've taken to dealing with those. Yes. So, um, so when you look at a histogram, okay, so let me, let me pull my PowerPoint again. I'm gonna draw some crappy drawings here. Uh, you guys have to be patient. Where are the pens? Okay. So let's say I have a histogram. I, have a, I know it's not, doesn't look, this is not a histogram. I'm actually talking about the X and Y axis, okay? It's already looking ugly. Um, and let's say I have a histogram that goes like this, okay? And assuming this is zero and this is 256, okay? This is uniformly distributed, nice looking histogram. But let's take another histogram that's kind of like this, okay? Um, everything is squished, squished to the left and there's nothing on the right side, okay? Um, so the moment you see this an image, this kind of an image, you should think about image enhancement, okay? Because when a computer displays an image for you, it tries to display all the pixel values possible. So it goes and reads an image and says, okay, this image is a 256-bit image, so I'm going to show all pixel values from zero to 256. When it tries to show that, you literally have only pixels from zero to 100. There is nothing from 100 to 256. Then what is the point of showing everything from 100 to 256, right? So immediately you should think, I need to do image enhancement so that I can then take this histogram, this squished histogram, and stretch it so that it, it spans the whole range, okay? This is not just for visual purpose, but many calculations actually depend on it. Many calculations are assuming that if you have a nice looking histogram that is spread for all pixel values, then it does its calculation in a much better way, okay? So for example, let's take Rene for example. Um, uh, maybe there is another one, let me think of it. Okay, uh, this example would be even better. So there's a technique called triangle segmentation, okay? The idea is actually pretty simple. It f finds the last peak. No, it finds the last peak. It finds the end. Basically, if let's say this peak is at 90 and the end is at 2 to 6, it draws a triangle between this, this, and this, okay? Between 90, 256, and the bottom of 90. 
And then the point at which that line, the, you can think of the hypotenuse, uh, where it got the maximum distance from the, uh, sorry, the point where the hypotenuse, if you draw a perpendicular line, it hits the histogram and the place where the distance is maximum, that's considered the threshold, okay, the triangle segmentation, okay? But the problem is, if this histogram was this, if the histogram was nicely stretched, the threshold is going to be very different, right? Because it has stretched, it's not going to be 90, it's going to be like maybe 170, 180, okay? So that does have an effect. Applying that image enhancement does have an effect, okay? The same rule applies when it comes to a histogram that goes like this. The histogram is, every, is completely on the right side and nothing on the left side, it's bad too, okay? Ideal histogram is one where all the pixels have equal distribution, which means the probability of occurrence of all pixels are exactly the same. But the reality, it'll never happen because we are trying to image real world where real world is not uniform. Real world has lots of different things. Like if I take a picture of this, the left side of the room is uniform, right side is a little bit uniform, but the rest of the room looks very different, okay? So that's the real world. So you will never get the ideal histogram, but whenever you acquire an image, at least in the medical and microscope world, I always recommend people to acquire an image where the histogram is actually evenly distributed, as much as possible. Otherwise, you end up with a scenario where you have to stretch the image and that's okay, but again, as I told you, with a filter, you have side effects. Image enhancement also has its side effects. Okay, so if you acquire the image right the first time, then you don't have the side effect. Okay. And that's just some of it, but once you, start looking at a histogram and looking at the corresponding filter, you will realize there is actually more interesting details you can learn from just looking at the histogram. Okay. Any other question? Okay. Oh, question? Okay. <laughs> All right, I don't want to hold you guys from your lunch, so, yeah. Um, yeah so are there any, uh, Libraries in place for doing this sort of thing with video. I mean, or or are people uh, um, like uh, must people do do this sort of thing to uh, to every frame of an of, of a video sequence? Uh, OpenCV actually can do that. Uh, using OpenCV, you can literally take a video. In fact, OpenCV there are examples you can find online where you can just put a webcam. Today you don't even have to put a webcam; every laptop has it. Uh, you can just take a picture of yourself, not even a picture, it's a motion moving picture of you, and then it can process them at real time, as long as you have a GPU and, or a good CPU. You can just do it at real time. All right, thank you so much.